everybody my name is Nikki and today I'm going to read to you um, the third part of House on Mangle Street but before I read start reading to you I would like to tell you a little bit more information about the author Sandra Cisneros so this information is from a biography online and I will um, put the link in the description to the website it says, American writer and poet, born on December 20th, 1954, in Chicago, Illinois. One of seven children and the only daughter, she has written extensively about the Latina experience in the United States. Cisneros is best known for The House on Mango Street, written in 1984, which tells the story of a young Latina woman coming of age in Chicago. The novel has sold more than two million copies. Cisneros has explored many, many literary forms in her work. She wrote several collections of poetry, including My Wicked, Wicked Ways in 1987, which was well received by critics. She created an impressionistic portrait of life on the border between the United States and Mexico through a series of vignettes in Woman Hollering Creek and other stories, written in 1991. Cisneros has received numerous awards for her work, including the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 1995 and the Texas Medal of the Arts in 2003. She lives in San Antonio, Texas. Okay, so now I'm going to start to read to you from the novel. And this chapter or this vignette is called Louis, His Cousin, and His Other Cousin. Downstairs from Mimi's is a basement apartment that Mimi's mother fixed up and rented to a Puerto Rican family. Louis's family, Louis is the oldest in a family of little sisters. He is my brother's friend, really, but I know he has two cousins and that his t-shirts never stay tucked in his pants. Louis's girl, Louis's girl cousin is older than us. She lives with Louis's family because her own family is in Puerto Rico. Her family is Merin or Maris or something like that. And she wears dark nylons all the time and lots of makeup she gets from selling Avon. She can't come out, gotta babysit with Louis' sisters. But she stands in the doorway a lot, all the time singing, clicking her fingers, the same song. Apples, peaches, pumpkin pie, you're in love and so am I. Louis has another cousin. We only saw him once, but it was important. We were playing volleyball in the alley when he drove up in this great big yellow, yellow Cadillac with white walls and a yellow scarf tied around the mirror. Louis's cousin had his arm out of the window. He honked a couple of times and a lot of faces looked out from Louis's back window and then a lot of people came out. Louis, Marine, and all the little sisters. Everybody looked inside the car and asked where he got it. There were white rugs and white leather seats. We all asked for a ride and asked where he got it. Louis's cousin said, get in. We each had to sit with one of Louis's little sisters on our lap, but that was okay. The seats were big and soft like a sofa, and there was a little white cat in the back window whose eyes lit up when the car stopped or turned. The windows didn't roll up like a or in ordinary cars. Instead, there was a button that did it for you automatically. We rolled up the alley and rolled around the block six times, but Louis's cousin said he was going to make us walk home if we didn't stop playing with the windows or touching the FM radio. The seventh, the seventh time we drove into the alley, we heard sirens. Real quiet at first, but then louder. Louis's cousin stopped the car right where we were and set everybody out of the car. Then he took off flooring that car into a yellow blur. We hardly had time to think when the cop car pulled in the alley going just as fast. We saw the yellow Cadillac at the end of the block trying to make a left hand turn. But our alley is too skinny and the car crashed into a lamppost. But he screamed and we ran, screamed and we ran down the block to where the cop, cop car's siren spun a dizzy blue. The nose of that yellow Cadillac was all pleated like alligators, and except for a bloody lip and a bruised forehead, Louis's cousin was okay. 
they put handcuffs on him and put him in the back seat of the cop car and we all waved as they drove away. Medin. Medin's boyfriend is in Puerto Rico. She shows his let she shows us his letters and makes us promise not to tell anybody they're getting married when she goes back to Puerto Rico. She says he didn't get a job yet, but she's saving the money she gets from selling Avon and taking care of her cousins. Redding says that if she stays here next year, she's going to get a real job downtown because that's where the best jobs are. Since you always get to look beautiful and get to wear nice clothes, and can meet someone in the subway who might marry you and take you to live in a big house far away. But next year, Louis' parents are going to send her back to her mother with a letter saying she's too much trouble and that is too too bad because I like Medine. She is older and knows lots of things. She is the one who told us how Davy and the babysitter got pregnant and the baby sister got pregnant and what cream is best for taking off mustache hair and if you count the white flex on your fingernails you can know how many boys are thinking of you and lots of other things I can't remember now. We never, we never see Marine until her aunt comes home from work, and even then she can only stay out in front. She is there every night with the radio. When the light in her aunt's room goes out, Marine lights a cigarette, and it doesn't matter if it's cold out, or if the radio doesn't work, or if we've got nothing to say to each other. What matters, Marine says, is for the boys to, to see us, and for us to see them. And since Marine's skirts are shorter, and since her eyes are pretty, and, and since Marine is already older than us in many ways, the boys who do pass by say stupid things like, I am in love with those two green apple apples you call eyes. Give them to me, why don't you? And Marine just looks at them without even blinking and is not afraid. Medin under the streetlight, dancing by herself, is singing the same song somewhere. I know. Is waiting for a car to stop, a star to fall, someone to change her life. Those who don't. Those who don't know any better come into our neighborhood scared. They think we're dangerous. They think we will attack them with our shiny knives. They are stupid people who are lost and got here by mistake. But we aren't afraid. We know the guy with the crooked eye is Davy and the baby's brother. And the tall one next to him and the straw brim, that's Rosa, Eddie V, and the big one that looks like a dumb grown man. He's fat boy, though he's not fat anymore, nor a boy. All around, all, all around, we are safe. But watch us drive into a neighborhood of another color, our knees go shakety shake and our car windows get rolled up tight and our eyes look straight. Yeah, that's how it goes and goes. There was an old woman. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. Rosa Vargas' kids are too many and too much. And it's not her fault, you know, except she is their mother and only one against so many. They are bad, those Vargases, and how can they help it with only one mother who was tired all the time from buttoning and bottling and bathing, and who cries every day for the man who left without even leaving a dollar for bologna or a note explaining how come. The kids bend trees and bounce between cars and dangle upside down from knees and almost break like fancy museum bases you can't replace. They think it's funny. They are without respect for all living things, all things living, including themselves. But after a while, you get tired of being worried about kids who aren't even yours. One day, they are playing chicken on Mr. Benny's roof. Mr. Benny says, hey, ain't you kids no better than to, swing, to, than to be swinging from up there? Come down, you come down right now. And then they just split. See, that's what I mean. No wonder everybody gave up. Just stop looking out when little Efren chipped his buck tooth on a parking meter and didn't even stop Refugia from getting her head stuck with, between two slats in the back gate. And nobody looked up not once the day Angel Vargas learned to fly and drop from the sky like a sugar donut, just like a falling star, and exploded down to earth without even an O. Oh.
Alicia, who sees mice. Close your eyes and they'll go away, her father says. Or you're just imagining. And anyway, a woman's place is sleeping so she can wake up early with a tortilla star. The one that appears early just in time to rise and catch the hind legs behind, high legs hide behind the sink. Beneath a four clawed tub, under the swollen flat floorboards, nobody fixes in the corner of your eyes. Alicia, whose mama died, is sorry there is no one older to rise and make the lunchbox, tor lunchbox tortillas. Alicia, who is inherited, who, ha who inherited her mama's rolling pin and sleepiness, is young and smart and studies for the first time at the university two trains and a bus because she doesn't want to spend her whole life in a factory or behind a rolling pin. As a good girl, my friend, studies all night and sees the mice, the ones her father says do not exist. He is afraid of nothing except four-legged fur and fathers. So I'm going to stop there. But that's part of the reason why I like this novel so much. It's because it touches on so many gender issues and society issues that if you don't really pay attention can kind of evade you but especially as I get older I can kind of relate to some or more of this novel like when it talks about how she sees mice but the father doesn't believe her is it that she sees them and he just doesn't care enough to listen or to try to find out what she's talking about or is it because she's under stress and hallucinating and sees something that isn't there?